टुडे वी आर प्रिवलेज टू हैव विद अस चेतन जी चेतन बालसेकर ब्रदर ऑफ रमेश बालसेकर एंड आई हैव रिक्वेस्टेड हिम टू टेक अस थ्रू द अ गाइडेड पीस मेडिटेशन सो द मेडिटेशन इज आर स्टैंडर्ड हाफ एन आवर after he finishes whatever time is left will complete that half an hour so if it takes 15 minutes there'll be 15 minutes sitting in silence if it takes 20 minutes there'll be 10 minutes thereafter anyone wants to share anything ask anything either to chetan ji or to me you are welcome to do that i'd also like to <clears throat> mention that it would be quite enlightening for you all to visit him at his home and ask him questions or ask him to share his life's experiences because it is a life lived through the lens of advaita i have always found him to be very jovial lighthearted joyful peaceful always smiling never down no matter what the circumstances are to me that is enlightened living big words like realizing the self abiding in being those are pointers but to see your teaching being lived in daily living is what i would say is proof of the pudding otherwise it's theory so shall we begin so you all may uh, if you like to keep your eyes closed or open up to you and uh, the meditation will start now the gautams in north mid we will now start the peace meditation i shall state the words and you may you will you may meditate on the words i am speaking we will start i am peace surrounded by peace i dwell safely in peace peace is above beneath and within me such peace is mine and all is well i radiate peace to all beings i radiate peace between all beings I attract peace from all beings. Such peace is mine and all is well. I am filled with peace. I am absorbed in peace. I am overflowing with peace. Such peace is mine and all is well. We will stay in this peace for some time and then take a return journey.
In holy places, above samadhis, above the Guru Granth Sahib in the Golden Temple, you'll always find a canopy. That is the canopy of peace. It actually exists in the subtle dimension. And those who could see that have then brought it down to the physical dimension, the canopy of peace. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone like to ask anything? I'm Sunita. Yeah. Um, peace is there. I, I'm able to stay with it 
fleetingly. But as much as as much as peace is there, the noise is so much. And some days I feel like I'm gonna go crazy because the noise is just it has the power to completely consume me. Are you referring to the specific challenge which you are going through or in general? Oh, just the chatter of the mind is just immense and I don't know how to stop it and I don't have the maturity to hold it both, to hold both, to hold peace and the chatter. The draw is to choose one, either the chat or the peace. And when I choose one, it's it's not good. As in, it's it's not useful for what I'm looking for. When I choose only the peace, I can't live in the world. When I choose the chatter, I can't live with peace. And it's just the fight is just overwhelming. Well said. Well said. You are speaking on behalf of all of us. But as long as there is one to choose, there will not be peace. I know this and I... I want to choose peace. I don't want the chatter. I don't want the thinking mind doing cartwheels. That is what is disturbing the peace. Yeah, I, I sat one day as I was sitting in meditation. Previously, I had felt like, oh, I can't, I don't have the maturity to hold space for both. And there was a voice that says, but who are you to hold space exactly. for both? Exactly. Of course, you don't have the maturity to hold space for both. <laughs> you can't. Because that is control. Sunita is trying to control the situation and feels she can choose between peace and a turbulent mind. If one did have that choice, one would obviously choose peace all the time. Yes, and I think in trying to do that, I've escaped life a lot. I try to escape life a lot. Yes. And it's not working anymore. Yes, it can be in fact very frustrating. Rather, to see that the nature of life is duality of every conceivable kind. I will not be at peace sometime, especially when turbulence is going on, I'm in a crisis situation, some event has taken place. But even that is witnessed. But to make a demand that I can't hold my peace, can you imagine the pressure the ego is placing on itself through the act of doership? Control and doership are synonyms. This control has to be given up. And when the mind is in turmoil, even that is witnessed. It is the witnessing of that turmoil that brings the peace. I understand what you're saying, but I don't know it. You don't know? I don't know it. Yes. But you have certainly had a taste of it. You know what peace is, no doubt. And therefore, there is a preference for peace. Someone who has seen enough in life seen setbacks, challenges, crises, will certainly know what peace is. By the simple fact that I, if I'm going through a turbulent part of my life, I know that nothing is better than the peace of deep sleep. That one night of deep sleep gives me so much peace. That is my own experience. 
But because I know this now, I want this peace all the time. Which means I want to determine an outcome all the time and that outcome must be peace. This is how the ego is designed. And all that is needed, as my teacher would say, the seeing is the only doing necessary. When we accept, we will have some good days, some not so good days, such as the flow of life then we are gentler on ourselves. We are not trying to be this perfect being who is always immersed in peace. We have to allow that to happen. Mm. Strangely, when I allow that to happen, or maybe I think that when I allow that to happen, there's a lot of rage. There's a lot of rage. And why would you feel that there is a lot of rage? I, I see it in how I am in the world. Like when I interact with people, it's so quick to come up. It, it's so easily unleashed. And I've, I've been sitting with this rage for a, while, for a while and it's, now it's become very clever. I don't know when it's going to come up. Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows what triggers them. You are being honest about it by saying it here. Nobody knows. But normally... If I look within, this rage comes up because I don't like things the way they are and I have a notion of how they should be. So I rage against it. If someone expresses an opinion which is contrary to mine, I don't accept the fact that they are entitled to have their point of view. I rage against their point of view. And the joke is, this rage too is not mine. This is the exact experience I had just last evening. I was raging and there was a part of me that's saying, who's doing this? What is this? It was so peaceful and I was just so confused. I, was, I didn't know what was going on. Pent up rage, for example, since our formative years, since childhood, all the conditioning we were bombarded with, bombarded with created an ego with a sense of separation and doership. And that ego starts expressing rage. So it's clearly not your doing. Because if it was your doing and you could control it, you would. But when we start understanding where does this come from, what is behind it, it's more like an exploration. When that starts happening, by and by things start revealing themselves. Someone who is unaware, let's say, who has not been exposed to the spiritual dimension or some wisdom teachings or whatever it be, will live a life in unawareness and will rage continuously. But someone like you, who has had a taste of peace, who is coming to a place like this, is going to ask questions. Because the journey within has begun. That in itself one should be thankful to God for. So many of us are blindsided by life and we are just living out patterns unconsciously, you could say. 
So what you are going through, this turmoil is part of the journey within. Has anyone gone mad because of it? Well, you must have heard of something called the dark night of the soul. Many have gone through that process too. It feels like I'm doing it over and over and over again. And so what do you feel anchors you? When that happens, what do you feel anchors you in peace? Sitting quietly, sitting in silence, and saying yes. Saying yes, thy will be done. It takes courage to say that. When the ego realizes my will, my precious will, which I thought was so precious, is really hollow. Then the die will be done arises. And then I stop making sense of life like I used to with the left brain, the analytical brain, thinking things through all the time, cause and effect relationships and so on. Now that is given up. That giving up is what we call surrender. I think I want it so badly, I stopped myself from having it, actually. You know why? Because the ego is afraid to die. That is the last defense of the ego. Yeah, it's, right now it's like an insect in a bottle, just fluttering about so much, trying to save itself. And it's so painful, and I don't know what else to do but to sit with it, but it's quite overwhelming sometimes. And to allow surrender to happen. It is the cusp. But the consolation is there is no going back. There is no going back to the old you. That is why when a master like Sai Baba says Shraddha and Saburi, he is not only referring to the mundane level in your business have faith and patience, in relationships have faith and patience. It comes into play on the spiritual journey. Faith that whatever happens is the will of God. Patience. Why? We don't know what the divine timing is. We want to push our way through to it. We want to draw towards us certain outcomes. Simple words, faith and patience, but so deep. But I also don't know how to live anymore. Like I don't know how to make a decision. <laughs> I don't know what to trust. I don't know when it's my mind saying, oh, do this. Because the 
it's very blurred now the boundary of in daily living we have to take decisions if i go into a shop to buy a dress with the intention of buying one dress and i see two which i like i have to choose one if i don't like any i leave the shop but now i know that the decision is not my decision my decision is based on my genetics and conditioning which god made so whether i choose the blue dress or i choose the yellow dress is actually not my decision <laughs> i have been given a preference for a certain color but now because i take the responsibility it is my decision and i buy the yellow dress and i go home and try it on and i realize oh god this does not suit me i feel guilty i feel bad that i took the wrong decision you see how it works that is what takes away my peace of mind but when this weight of the decision is given up is surrendered because it is no longer my decision then why is decision making a problem the problem with decision making is i'm afraid whether i'm taking the right decision or the wrong decision that is the problem taking a decision itself is not the problem if i don't feel like taking a decision i don't take it if i have the option to postpone the decision i postpone it wait for a time when the mind is clearer perhaps no problem my teacher would say if you're confused toss a coin and he didn't mean it only lightly what it means is a decision has to be taken knowing that while i do have a preferred outcome it may or may not happen if the preferred outcome does not happen i may feel bad but there will be no guilt and shame and if i get the outcome i want i will feel happy but there will be no pride and arrogance i will not gloat and say i did the right thing that is all something in me wants to and not something but yeah the doer in me wants to yeah wants to keep claiming everything which is true does not want to give up the throne not only in me others i don't want to give up the notion that others are the doers of their actions and so i hold them accountable and responsible and then i convict them of crimes hold them guilty and then dole out punishment that obsession is given up
have you followed any spiritual teachings i think i asked you this before no this is the first time i'm speaking with you i've been um, with adya shanti adya shanti adya shanti yeah for a while now for many years you were in the us no 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 from here <laughs> it was online yeah i've never met him um but he retired from teaching and last year i said i need i need another teacher and your video had popped up on my feed i came to bombay a year ago almost but it's taken me a year to actually come here came from where from bangalore bangalore you're here on assignment or work no i'm staying here still staying here. doing something i work in mental health i'm a therapist yeah mental health so you have patients yeah i i work with people i have a private practice I was reading an interesting article this morning in the newspaper on Kashmir. And with all the decades of turbulence and what has been going on, how there are so many mental health patients in Kashmir but not enough doctors for them. It's quite a crisis situation. can you imagine there's so much turmoil in certain parts of the world as we know what the mental health must be in such places there will never be enough doctors my friend gabriel would say the world is an asylum <laughs> it is true <laughs> it what it it's what it feels like sometimes it's what it feels like sometimes that everyone is just mad and when he would come to our guru satsang and he met someone new when he was in a lighter mood he'd say welcome to the sick dogs club <laughs> <laughs> but i do say what my guru said always consider your glass half full and not half empty i would love that it sounds like a cliche but what he would say is if god has brought you so far why do you assume he will drop you here isn't that beautiful so beautiful so i would say there's no need to be too pessimistic the gratitude that at least some amount of peace has been tasted by me when that arises it's very beautiful and the world needs more people like you who are helping other people so it is god's job to help you we all are familiar with the saying as you sow so shall you reap my teacher would say in life it appears that you sow and someone else reaps that is everyone's experience also <laughs> you're doing all the efforts someone else is getting the rewards <laughs> but actually one is cause and effect as you sow so shall you reap the other is at the subtle level 
as you sow means what are the seeds being sown in your consciousness so shall you reap them if the seeds of hatred malice jealousy envy condemnation pride arrogance guilt shame as these are sown so shall you reap that is why the emphasis on peace what is the content of my consciousness right now that is what i am sowing see how subtle these wisdom teachings are they are plucking out the weeds from the soil they are not allowing them only to manifest that is why peace is so underestimated it sounds too simple too plain too boring and so we find that as it is life is full of challenges but we add to that burden of challenges by this incessant turmoil of the thinking mind Well, as my teacher would say simple imprisonment has got converted to rigorous imprisonment so your husband or someone was diagnosed with an illness right or am i mistaking it to for someone else not you anyone else yeah so no something entirely different what we are currently discussing so uh, we are in path of uh, knowledge uh, people who are in path of bhakti they ask uh, uh, any people who are following path of knowledge that in kali yuga you need to follow path of bhakti and surrender to god completely and take his name so that is the only uh, choice you need to make whether today tomorrow or after so many after years like someone says like i was following say uh, uh, ganapati for like 15 20 years but then i was drawn to the next level that is krishna so krishna is uh, the highest uh, to whom you need to worship to get salvation on earth so what is your take on that what is my take on that bhakti is the only path only path i mean to say in this kali yuga it seems that is the simplest to reach the highest is what uh, their teaching or maybe their uh, so you have friends immersed in yeah. bhakti who are telling you you're wasting your time coming here no no but <laughs> <laughs> chetan ji anything to add no <laughs> obviously nobody will say that straight <laughs> i feel this has been misunderstood bhakti and advaita or gyan are both the way they, they have been presented is too straight jacket if you have the total acceptance at this point in your life nobody is the doer of their actions 
that means you have accepted that God is the primal doer. Right? Would not you call that bhakti? I suggest asking this to the bhakti people. Are you at peace in daily living? Are by and large your relationships harmonious? Nobody can have a 10 on 10 score or 100 on 100 or 1000 on 1000, but by and large, are you at peace in your interactions? What is your outlook when people perform certain actions? You see, that is why Joel Goldsmith said something very important. And now I'm mixing up two streams of Gyan because they are so complementary. He said, my relationships are no longer with people. They are with God. Because I have seen the one hand behind the many. I would call that Bhakti. I would call that Krishna. Krishna consciousness, the descent of Krishna consciousness is what? Let's not just look at the image of Krishna which I am praying to in my temple. I am is Krishna consciousness. Now some people are designed in a certain way that for them it's simpler to chant the name of God and worship their chosen deity. They are not designed to follow the path of knowledge. Some people are. So this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. Everyone has certain dispositions, inclinations, and towards that they go. Now the question is, as far as you are concerned, you heard what the people say about Kali Yuga and Bhakti. Where you stand right now in daily living, you have to ask yourself, do I find my peace in understanding what life is about, the path of knowledge, or... Do I find it in chanting God's name? And then choose one of the two. Or do both. If you are happy to and it does not create conflict, even that is fine. So ultimately it boils down to oneself. Let society say what it says. You have to decide for yourself. Where is my peace to be found? I mean, can you imagine if I call myself a Krishna Bhakt, but I'm abusing people <laughs> at work? Would not that be hypocrisy? Because on one level I say, Krishna is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, all-knowing, all-pervading, all-powerful, all-being. But in daily living, it's gone out the window. How would that happen? What kind of Krishna Bhakti would that be? These are all states of consciousness. It is not that one is above the other, the other level of consciousness is above the other. It's not like that. Why is Ganpati worshipped when we start a venture? Krishna is not worshipped when we start a venture. The lord of auspicious beginnings is Ganpati. The remover of obstacles is Ganpati. That is a state of consciousness. The trunk of Ganpati is the active third eye 
The big belly is the active Manipur chakra. You and me cannot see that. So we are given the form of Ganpati, which if we worship, we activate these centers which allow us to take balanced decisions, which will lead to an auspicious beginning. So the so-called role of Ganpati in this case is this. Krishna is not invoked for this. So you see, this is this has to be understood thoroughly. Yeah, why I asked this very straight was like I have an actual uh, thing happening where like somebody who actually followed uh, say 15-20 years for Lord uh, uh, Ganapati, then he says he actually by doing that maybe I have been uh, asked to do Krishna's Bhakti. So now I ask everybody directly to do the Krishna's Bhakti instead of doing 15 years or wherever you want to go and then come to Krishna. So that's what that was what I was told. So I asked the same. Yeah. If you feel in your heart you have to follow his advice, you should. You know, Krishna was dark complexioned. He was not blue. You know that. Blue is a state of consciousness. It's a color. No, very subtle things. If you feel like following your friend, you must follow your friend. And if you feel like coming here also, you're welcome to do that. Yeah, so the other following question, not to exactly on same, but the other is, like while uh, we, we are in this group or maybe uh, more uh, intellectual or maybe people who are with similar uh, following, uh, then we accept everything. But when you are in the crowd, right? So, where lakhs of people are there, uh, then this uh, same decision or sta same state of mind is not there. And you don't feel like he is also God's creation, but you tend to go into dispute and all. So, you don't actually uh, see, them, uh, see them as God's creation or maybe somehow you uh, come up with some or the other differences and you fight. So, why is that? That is because as of now, there is still a distinction for you between the mundane world and the spiritual world. The Sangha is where everyone here is looking for the same thing. They are looking for peace and harmony. This is all fine. Out of here, when I am out there, it's not the same. Because that distinction is there. When the seeing changes and you see that the whole show of life, all the characters in the movie of your life are playing their role according to their blueprint, then these masks will not be worn anymore by you. So let's say, forget lakhs of people, let's say I'm invited to a party. I'm wearing a mask. I'm playing a role. I want to impress people, which holidays I went to, which uh, movies I saw, whatever it may be. By and by, this distinction starts dropping away. The wearing of masks starts dropping away. Then whether it's 1 lakh people, 10,000 people, 1,000 people, 100 people, 10 people or one person, I am the same. Yes, I will adhere to the norms of society, the niceties, the pleasantries, so that I don't offend people, I don't step on anyone's toes. But then I will choose where to spend my time and where not to. That is what will happen. My preferences may change. I may no longer want to go to parties I used to go to earlier or gatherings or whatever because my interests have changed. 
For example, gossip does not attract me like it used to. So I stop going to such kind of gatherings. Or I go for some time and leave. So I start navigating my life this way. That's what happens. I have a question for Chetan Ji. So, uh, you're probably the only person I know who had, had the privilege to meet Nisar Data Maharaj. So, you're the only person I know who had the privilege to meet Maharaj. So, uh, it would be really interesting for us to know your experiences with him and how, uh, you know, the teaching was lived through him and maybe some pointers he would make which would bring you closer to the truth from your experience, if any. Yeah. Your experiences and any pointers he gave you which brought you closer to the truth. I, I went with him with the truth when I heard from him the truth. Originally. So I didn't go to him. I went, got truth from him outside and then I went to him. Hmm. People used to ask him questions and answer. If somebody asked him a foolish question, he would say, That was the point. <laughs> he wanted pointed. <laughs> Get out was the point. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ask any foolish question? No, never. <laughs> I didn't dare. <laughs> Yeah, but this thing he would say that, uh, you know, you are this impersonal presence prior to thought, the I am. Right? That's how he would call the state, the I am. Would he say abide in that as in be in that state all the time? Was that his pointer? Or would he say just contemplate on that? So your self-identity should be I am. If you look into the mirror, what do you see? A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and person. You should see peace. So, so what is your identity? Is your identity that of a person or is your identity that of the self? Your identity should be that of the self, not of a person. The important thing is always be careful of your identity all the time. Forget everything else. Identity is all. If you think of it as a person, do all this and still remain as a person, you're wasting your time. When he went to his guru, his guru told him, you are that. And he accepted that. That is the simplicity of the mind. Yes. A simple mind can accept that. A mind which is too indoctrinated in thinking will not have that simplicity. So you are that, yes, I am that. Because there was full trust in the Guru. That is, uh, requires a very high degree of innocence. You don't question. Here we question. Yes. All the time. Acceptance. <laughs> See, if I am already that, why that person is having so many struggles in daily living all the time? Means 
if you are that that means the highest right then why still that means after having that understanding also why there are so many struggles for daily living as well it should be it should have, it should have minimized right after you realize or maybe if you say that i am already that it's not just the understanding <clears throat> you must be that you can know everything about daily all the knowledge that is quite different from living in daily being that does not mean your troubles will get over <laughs> no <laughs> no means not being that means you have to come to that understanding of so long as the body is there that is why my teacher would keep it very simple enlightenment does not mean you'll be able to walk on water or find a car park space whenever you need it what you are saying is if i'm that life is easy <laughs> it doesn't mean it means through the challenges and vicissitudes of life i am that that is peace that is what it means I just wanted the expansion on the word in the phrase "I am that." I just got it from you now, so I didn't find the need to ask a question. "I am that" means I am peace. You could say that. You could say that. <laughs> 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 so am i right in uh, assuming or i am am i right in the acceptance of the fact that i am that means i am in a state of peace of mind is that is it i am that well explained as the way i think it to be peace is what i am that's a reversal of the same thing i am peace Yes, peace is one. There are not two. There are not two. There are not two. Peace is what I am, or I am. One. Peace. Everyone thinks. Everyone. Acha, now I'll tell you. So you're a smoker, right? Heavy. Ha. Huh. <laughs> so I'll tell you something. You but assure me you won't use this if someone tells you about your smoking. Oh, well, huh? Three conditions. Are you serious? So. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Maharaj used to smoke the BD all the time. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, all the time. But that's healthy, and then what I smoke? Whatever it is. So someone asked him once. Someone told him you are addicted to smoking, and he replied, "You are addicted to not smoking." <laughs> 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 no, but I have told you, you cannot. No, 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 no. not allowed. I am going to use this, and when people say, "Please step aside," I said, "I would say you please step aside and join me in this." <laughs> Thank you, sir, for clarifying that. <laughs> Chetan ji, what is uh, Ramesh ji was also your brother and a teacher for so many of them. How was your relationship with him, and uh, his entire journey? I mean, your entire journey with him. How was it? Brother to brother, mother and guru, more than brother to brother. Teaching to Maha. ಹೌದಿ <laughs> And then I saw this guy. I was extremely impressed. And he told me, "Fantastic." And imagine if you said I was not impressed, he would not have gone. He might not have. Gone. <laughs> yes. So I can take a lot of pain. <laughs> <laughs> the 
Men jeg får også vente med den skrælles. Men nu er jeg har en pisse. And there were already people there in his yes, 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 we were already there. And to, all this used to first, first say when you sit in Palm Beach shop. You talk to people. So that shop was there at that yes, time? Yes, it was there. Imagine. Satsang at Palm Beach? Pardon? The Satsang was at the shop? No, no, then it is at his house. They have a small Palm Beach shop in his house. No, no, at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Shop was outside. Okay. So, what is the relevance of that shop outside his house? No, no, no relevance. No, that was his business. That was his business. And yeah. I should start selling cigarettes. Start? <laughs> you should. I think the shop is open. Good, good, good concept. Yes. <laughs> the light is off. <laughs> Yes, you'll have to talk louder because you're so far away today that when she sits here, I can't hear her. So now <laughs> this will be a real challenge. You can see only the lips moving. I'll try my best. Can you hear? So I, I don't want to ask, but I just want to share this. Like, you know, it's so true to have a living guru. I just uh, had cross like this session of uh, Roger Castillo uh, like where he had some five questions which he was really troubled with his peace in daily living. So when I heard few of his questions that were really some of mine question also. So this is what I said like the simplicity when you have a living guru like what dialogue he had with uh, Ramesh. So it's really beautiful because you know otherwise if you don't have a person in living You can just continue with because your mind can think whatever it wants and maybe you'll never reach to that destination. So, but what conclusion was that, like Ramesh said, like even if you're enlightened, but if you're not peace in the daily living, how does it serve you? So it's so beautiful, like, you know, like it's, as you say, it's so downrated. The peace is so downrated, but you know, it is the most important. And I also want to share, like once you were in Rishikesh, and that session had come in online on YouTube where you said that you happened to meet a woman who had had many mystical experiences and she was maybe 20, 30, 40 years in spiritual journey, but still she was not peace at mind. So that moment I realized, uh, like because even I was looking for self-realization, then I realized if that is the case, I don't want to end my day like that. You know, if I want to end my life, it should be peace of living. So, and believe me, when I dropped it, and it was just a thought away. So, this is like how, like, you know, the seeking, 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 the thinking mind, the involvement, you don't see what is so obvious. But it was really beautiful, like, peace and daily living is the most. And I love to be in such a gathering. It's wonderful being here. Yeah, I agree because I was in such a gathering for 10 years. I always wonder how a day of Gotham looks like. Very boring. (laughs) (laughs) And lost. (laughs) You become a very boring person. Roger and me used to say we both would make very boring boyfriends. (laughs) When we were single. No mirch masala, drama. This is boring. This is boring. This is boring. That is the mind. A person coming to a spiritual satsang, if their mind is turbulent, what you have said is a very important pointer for them. Very important, which gets missed. It is actually 
the ego which cannot tolerate peace so the churn is going on and it is identified with that churn when that is dropped then only is the opportunity there for peace of mind it is so subtle it gets missed because the churn is the ego what is the content of my consciousness all the time if my thinking mind is going on and on and on is the content of my consciousness means i am not willing to let go of that story because i am identified with it it's got really nothing to do with others and nothing to do with myself i'm just seeing the ego the way it operates it's not me doing it i'm just seeing the structure which i never saw before churn 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 thinking it's to do with others this churn is causing me suffering taking away my peace of mind but the realization is there who am i without this churn it's too scary now i know i am the churn if that finishes who am i sure your father in law who we want to not through that experience like what if everything just drops away am i thinking and this is called the burden of memory i think it would be nice to discuss this at the next satsang it's a very important topic yes please yeah because it's my favorite also because past years uh, we actually we are constantly witnessing like what happens we are doing and memory goes away we keep looking out he doesn't know whether it's a day or night at least so much is there i mean how much we perceive in the memory yes so it's such a beautiful and my contemplation and one is the accumulation of memory the actual burden is the memory of what people did to me that is the burden not the memory itself do remember this for next time but then they found it everything but my husband seemed that he wasn't that dementia so he forgot everything the brain is no longer given that capacity it has been taken away they don't even know if they have to go to the bathroom they go somewhere else no memory but memory has been given to live life but the burden we carry of the memory is memory based on doership and the wisdom teachings the spiritual teachings the masters are pointing to this sometimes i used to happy for me he has forgotten everything yes because you know you know this yeah. that's why otherwise he would have suffered more but he does not know that he is happy <laughs> you see that is the difference and the the journey to enlightenment whatever you may call it must be in peace na no? must be at peace must be in peace because he used to look at us ke blankly yeah i don't understand who you are and what is going on everything so i used to feel happy the i was peaceful ki is not suffering here and physically also this is sure. because okay and mind also gone so he is not suffering otherwise he would have been having emotions ke what is happening with my body it has become very Correct. very exactly. thin yeah the awareness is not there awareness not there so now in that way i was very happy and now the learning is for you because you are in the situation yes, yes, yes. that's what we discuss <laughs> this thing yeah it's a great learning for us yeah.
but someone who has not come thus far like you have would not see all this what you are seeing they would consider it a curse why did god do this to me what have i done wrong why am i going through this torture and turmoil and the me 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 obsession builds up even my children also they were suffering a lot yeah because of they course. see him in that position sure. they were suffering yeah mm-hmm. so my full family attended the satsang two sessions you are two sessions they attended oh, really? i am uh, my son daughter and my daughter in law right. she is also in this field also she is a spiritual counselor so they all like it very yeah. much <laughs> maybe one can do it again sometime then yeah we'll take it my mind is got incident has happened like a friend of mine my mother was also having this mind problem that she is stopped and then so she was grounded in the so she used to talk to her mom and she her mom used to say I don't remember anything but she told her mom that you are still aware she said yes I am still aware so that was something which you know she understood that even if I don't have the memory and still have it. Yeah. That is a big point. Yeah. But I wonder if all those would say that who have lost their memory. Yeah. Would be interesting. Yeah, I don't think there's been this uh, uh, documentation also. The symbolically, uh, people are supposed to boil their memory, boil their past, like... Uh, I think as a question of doing sannyas also, if somebody is taking sannyas, he has to tell him name and new identity and cut all his old relationships and all his old past. Like this is a symbolic thing of the fire. Similarly, in Islam also, when a person goes for Hajj, mm. it's supposed to be a rebirth, where he's supposed to seek forgiveness from everyone and start a new chapter. So, all religious traditions, baptism also, so everything has a Uh, symbolic meaning of finishing the past so that you don't hold on to that memory the bitterness and then that story keeps replaying it's like being reborn you know? yes, very beautiful I think it's like a tool you could say offered, but the without the understanding, no, 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 how will this translate because you will never get rid of a memory no, no, no. So it's a symbolic it's, it's, it's symbolic creates that, facilitates that uh, that that thing but without understanding yeah so when the when the knowledge the divine knowledge is given that the memory is not the problem the burden of doership is and when that sting of doership is removed the memory is left as memory the tools are there but it doesn't but it's unconscious yeah because then we are continuing carrying the burden based on doership so it's not reforming us in any way you could say I just want to say something about the, the bhakti and the sure. and the jnan. It's just the thought which came to me. Actually, the whole purpose of even the Gita teaching is about sayama. Mm-hmm. It's a state of balance. And if you look at every chapter, like you look at jnan yoga or samcha yoga, second chapter, or the bhakti yoga, it's all about being in a state of equipoise, equilibrium where you don't get affected by the fluctuations of the mind. Mm. is emotions which like if somebody is rude to me somebody is good to me you know, I get and fluctuate i'm happy and sad so that balance is achieved so actually there's no difference between gyan yoga and bhakti yoga yes in the sense it all facilitates it's a emotional quotient bhakti yoga is actually emotional quotient right in like yoga bhakti samit yes your krishna keeps repeating in the bhakti yoga say advaita sarva bhutana meta karuna eva cha karma mo nirat kara Sabadukha, sukha, sabi. So it's balanced in sadness and happiness, with enmity, with friendship. Similarly, in Samkhya, it says the same thing. Yogastha pur karmani sangam tatya vadaranje siddhiya siddho sabadho sabadha vyoga uchita. So it's basically the whole, whole underlying theme is what 
Advaita is teaching, it's all about the balance of the mind. It's a, it's a fluctuation of the mind, mm. which creates all the disturbance. I mean, I mean, when we start allowing our emotions and mind to collude and, and interpret people's actions. Right. That's, uh, so it's, it's basically, I was just going to say, the bhakti and yeah, actually there's no difference. Yeah, absolutely. It's Beautiful. Very good. I can't recite all these shlokas. He's amazing. Yeah. Really, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, he's at another level. You must share your knowledge with us. I keep telling him that once he can give us like Ashtavakra Gita also he speaks about. He really? gives talks on Ashtavakra Gita. Yeah, we could do, you could do a series for us. Okay. Okay.